Hey everybody. So um, I just wanted to go over some things that uh, we had going on during my pregnancy that a lot of people didn't know about because we kept a secret, um, mainly because of how traumatic and overwhelming it was to go through what we went through. But um, I'm just going to kind of go through from the beginning to the end so that um, hopefully everybody can kind of get a better understanding of why we hit my pregnancy's information the way we did. So um, starting from the beginning, um, me and my wife, Devanna, we tried to get pregnant for a long time, um, and we kind of gave up hope um, back in like 2015. But for some reason this year in 2017, we decided that we knew that we were going to get married, but we decided to go ahead and try to get pregnant just one last time. Um, and we did artificial insemination and we just tried one time and it took and of course we were overjoyed. Um, so we found out in January that I was pregnant and we didn't tell anyone until March. And that was of course at my wedding for those of you who attended. Um, we kind of did a reveal and told everybody that um, we were pregnant. Um, we went on a honeymoon in March and while we were on our honeymoon, our genetic testing came in to let us know uh, what we were having. And I had a little gender reveal party at work and um, we found out that we were having a baby girl. Um, so I had a little complications in the beginning, like the normal things I think that people go through with, you know, having spotting and just little things that were alarming. So from the beginning, I was kind of panicking, thinking that, you know, maybe my baby would make it, but fortunately she made it out of the first trimester, which is, I guess, the most important trimester, and that's the time when people have miscarriages early on. So once we made it out of that first trimester, we thought that we had made it over the hurdle and that things were going to be great, and we were finally going to have our perfect little baby. Well, on May 31st, that's when I had my 20-week scan, and the scan revealed to what we thought that my baby had no brain. So the doctors thought she had a condition called hy hold, wait, hydrocephalus, which is basically um, where your okay, so your brain is supposed to form some kind of drainage, some kind of valve from the back of your head down to your spine, and it's supposed to drain the fluids from your brain. So on May 31st, when my scan revealed what appeared that my baby had no brain, um, they had hydrocephalus, which meant that her brain wasn't draining the way it should and her head was filled with fluid. So her head, what well, as we thought, had filled with so much fluid that her head was six weeks bigger than it should have been. So my baby was 20 weeks with the size head of a 26 week baby. So um, of course, that was traumatizing in itself and we were told that my baby wouldn't survive. So you know, we took that in and the very next day we were scheduled with what we what's called a maternal fetal specialist, which is basically like an OB, but they specialize in high risk pregnancy. So the very next day we saw the specialist and they said that my baby had some brain, just not all of the brain, but that they thought she didn't have hydrocephalus. They thought she had hydranencephaly, which that I believe is where your, the brain grows but it, the fluid still doesn't drain. So at that point, um, the fluid in my baby's head had compressed whatever brain had grown. So even though my baby had brain, her brain was compromised. So they still told me that, you know, she wasn't going to survive. So we, you know, were devastated. We didn't know what to do. The doctors kept telling me just to terminate her because she wasn't going to survive. And if she did survive, she wasn't going to live very long. Of course, I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I decided that abortion wasn't something that I could do. Now, of course, before pregnancy, I, I was always, you know, against abortion, and I thought, how could somebody do that? I would never do that. But to be in that position, you know, where I was faced with that, you know, that obstacle, you know, it definitely changed my perspective on things, but I didn't consider it. And of course, you know, 
I, I decided to continue with my pregnancy because that's what God told me to do. So my specialist told me that I had to get an MRI done and that the MRI would better tell us what was going on with my baby and that a neurosurgeon would be the one to better let us know where to go. So um, they scheduled my MRI, but between the time of my appointment for my MRI, I saw my specialist one more time and they did another scan and they said that my baby's brain, it wasn't that I, my baby had fluid in her head, it was that my baby's brain didn't form correctly. So they said that she had holoprosencephaly. Now mind you, all of these different diagnoses I'm giving you, they're worse and worse and worse as my pregnancy is going on. So with holoprosencephaly, this is something that they thought was linked to trisomy 13, um, which is where you have an extra chromosome. You're supposed to have two 13 chromosomes. And they said my baby possibly had three 13 chromosomes. Well, I had genetic testing done, and the genetic testing didn't say anything about extra chromosomes. But um, my doctors wanted me to do what's called an amniocentesis to better determine whether she had an extra chromosome or not. And I told them I didn't want to do that because there's a risk with amniocentesis that um, I could go into labor early. And at this point, I was only like 26 weeks. So I didn't want to risk the chance of going into labor early with my baby's life or ready to pry. So um, with the holoprosencephaly, though, I mean, they told me things that it was caused me to go into depression. Um, they told me that my baby was going to have one eye. She was going to have a cleft lip or cleft nose. She was going to have extra toes um, that, you know, they, they just told me really ugly things. Um, and I, I didn't believe them. I didn't accept it. And I prayed to God. And, you know, I told him however my baby was going to come out was how, how we were going to accept her because she was my baby. So um, it, it took what felt, I mean, it was two weeks after that until I got my MRI finally, but it, it felt like forever. But when I finally got my MRI, they determined that none of the three diagnoses were true, that my baby actually had a brain tumor. So um, they told me that the tumor was fatal, um, cancerous, and that my baby was gonna die inside me. Um, on July 13th, I saw an, a neurosurgeon, and he gave me some hope. He told me, your baby will li live at least 30 days, um, that she does have a tumor. It's the size of a baseball. Um, she does have brain, but her um, she only has 60% of her brain that she should have at this point in time. So, like I said, he was very hopeful. Um, he said that he didn't see any evidence of why my specialist told me that the tumor was cancerous because, you know, there's no way to tell in utero if something is cancerous without doing an amniocentesis, but um, that he, she definitely had some kind of mass there in her brain and it was compromising what, they was compromising her brain stem. So your brain stem is what allows you to breathe, or it's not what allows you, it's what controls your breathing, it's what controls um, your heart, your heart, your um, heart rate or your heart to be, it, makes your heart beat and it um, it's in charge of you know your swallowing your reflexes so they were say basically saying that um, there was a chance that my baby if she, if she survived she wasn't gonna breathe on her own her heart could stop at any point in time and she probably wouldn't be able to ever eat on her own meaning she would have to have a feeding tube for the duration of her life so the neurosurgeon said that he couldn't tell me whether or not surgery was gonna fix it but that we would determine this if my if my baby survived delivery that he would reevaluate her and he would decide what the best treatment option for her was so um after i saw my neurosurgeon i saw my mfm which is the specialist again and i mean even though a neurosurgeon has a degree and they study the brain um, my specialist argued and told me that the neurosurgeon was wrong he said that the tumor was compressing the brainstem. My baby was going to die in utero. 
And if she didn't die in utero, that she was going to be a stillborn. And if she wasn't a stillborn, she was going to die within 48 hours. And that if she didn't die within 48 hours, that she was never going to walk or talk or eat. And that she was going to struggle her whole life. Um, basically, he told me I was being selfish for wanting to continue my pregnancy. Um, I, I, I took it in. I went home. I prayed and I prayed. And at one point, I lost faith in God, and I questioned, why me? Um, you know, I stopped going in my baby's room. We stopped buying her stuff. Um, it was really hard. Um, but, um, you know, something in me told me not to give up and to fight for my baby, and I did. And um, in August, I saw all my specialists again, and... I, this point, um, I mean, they've already told me the most devastating news, but now they're telling me your baby weighs too much. Um, she's too fat, basically. Um, and it's probably because you're diabetic and this poses an even bigger threat to your baby's life because that means that she's not getting enough oxygen. Um, she's not, you know, it, it was just, it was just, you know, more things after more things. And they basically forced, they told me I was going to be forced to have a C-section, um, that there was no way I could pass her normally or regularly, that she she wouldn't fit due to the size of her head and the size of her body. Um, they, so now keep in mind, they're saying that my baby's head is six weeks bigger than it should be. And now her body, they said was four months, four weeks bigger than it should be. So basically I'm having a, a giant baby is what they were telling me, a giant baby who's not going to survive. Um, so they told me to go home and think about it, that I needed to deliver between 32 weeks and 36 weeks, and that I could not go past 36 weeks because my baby was going to rupture my uterus um, and that if she ruptured my uterus, I could hemorrhage, I could, you know, I could die or I would never be able to have kids again. So um, we went home and we thought about it and I, I, I just couldn't see myself having, having my baby earlier than I should. And, you know, she was already going to be faced with all of these challenges, but, I, you know, I didn't want to add prematurity on top of that. So we decided to deliver at 36 weeks, which was um, September 15th, which was um, last Friday, but we set the date, um, but this is in August. So we set the date and we, you know, continued on with the pregnancy, obviously. So in, on September 6th, I had another MRI because a neurosurgeon wanted to track the tumor to see how much it had grown or what it had done or, you know, what it basically was going to look like for baby. So um, I saw I saw my neurosurgeon the very next day after I had my MRI and he said, great news. He said, the tumor has not grown. It's going to be easy to take out. Your baby, she might survive. I have high hopes for her. You know, it's looking better. There's no evidence that it is cancerous, you know, he had really good news for me. And so finally, you know, we thought there was a light. We thought there was hope. So, um, you know, we, we made sure to come home. You know, we, we wanted to have everything ready for her because even if she lived a day, a week, a month, a year, you know, we were going to love her unconditionally no matter what, what diagnosis she had. So um, I saw my, my MFM specialist one last time. And, you know, he crushed all my hopes and dreams again. He said that he could, his ultrasounds were better than an MRI. And he could see the compression that the tumor was putting on my baby's brainstem. And he said that it did not look good. That, he, you know, they were surprised I had made it this far because at this point in time, this was two weeks ago. So at this point in time, I was 35 weeks. They were surprised that we had even made it this far. They were saying that, you know, she shouldn't have made it this far. And that, again, if she did survive, you know, until delivery, that she was going to be a stillborn. And if she wasn't a stillborn, she was going to die within her first few hours. Because that the only reason why she was surviving was because of me, because of the umbilical, umbilical cord, that I was providing her life. So once they took her out of me, that she was going to be unable to continue her life because her body wasn't strong enough and that the tumor was just going to basically make her heart stop. And there was nothing they could do about it. So, um, again, I, you know, we went home devastated because we thought that we had good news just to turn around and have bad news. So after that, um, I went home and then I started having these pains. So 
I went to the um, ER because, I mean, I'm a first time, you know, this is my first pregnancy. I don't know what contractions are. I don't know what anything is. And I just started having all these pains that were nonstop since six in the morning. Um, they, it was really hard, really unbearable. I could barely walk, you know, even laying down hurt. So we went to the ER. Um, they, of course, sent me home because they said the, that they were contractions, but they weren't strong enough to do anything with. So they sent me home and I immediately left the hospital and went to see my um, regular OB, which is the doctor that was going to deliver me. So um, she never gave up hope um, and she knew that I didn't give up hope. And so knowing that my baby was going to be delivered early and knowing that she said that I was having um, pre, what did she say? What did she say? I think she said, I, basically I was going into labor that because my baby was so big, she was pressing on my, in, on my pelvis. She had already dropped and that um, she might not make it to her delivery date. She might come sooner because just because she's so big and my body, couldn't handle all the pressure she was putting down there. That's why I was having pains. So she gave me a steroid shot and the steroid shot was to help my baby, to help her lungs, to help her grow. Now, mind you, I, I had asked my specialist to give me a steroid shot and they told me no, that my baby wasn't going to make it. So there was no point to keep the shot, to get the shot. But my, the, luck, luckily my OB, she, she had faith in me. And so she went ahead and gave me the shot. And um, she told me if I had any more pains just to come back, but otherwise we were going to plan to deliver my baby via C-section on um friday so last friday september 15th um i guess my my baby i guess she knew that it was going to be her day it was her time to come because at 10 a.m um, i started having contractions they were mild but i started having contractions and when i went in you know for my scheduled delivery they said i was already dilating and you know so i, I think my baby knew that it was her time um, to come but regardless um I went in and um, they prepped me for the C-section. You know, they did everything how a C-section goes. They numbed me, did all that stuff. And my wife was there with me holding my hand. And, you know, it, it was nerve-wracking uh, because we didn't know what to expect. But, um, you know, the, the, she was – we could see, like, um, on, on top of the ceiling, there was kind of like – a. a a reflection so we could see what the doctor was doing and so you know it was it was very stressful because I could see and I could see that the exact point that my baby was gonna come out and things like that so you know keep in mind we're thinking we're hoping that we hear my baby cry because if she didn't cry that meant that she was stillborn so we were waiting and waiting for her to take the baby out of me and you know she tells me okay she's almost here and I feel a nurse put all of her weight onto my tummy to push my baby out. And for what felt like 10 minutes, we heard nothing and my heart dropped. And then, you know, all of a sudden within, you know, a couple of seconds, this little angel let out the biggest cry ever. And she said, I'm here, everybody, I'm here. So I want everybody to meet my angel baby, Zylee. Her name is Zylee Paris. Um, so she let out the biggest cry in the world. I'm pretty sure the whole hospital heard her and she said, I'm here. So um, they immediately, um, well, this was, she was born, let me go back. She was born at um, 2.03 p.m. on September 15th. She weighed seven pounds, 12 ounces. She was big, but not as big as they said she was. And as you guys can tell, she has a normal size head. Um, but they immediately took her to Driscoll Children's Hospital because of the severity of, of her condition. And, um, you know, I, was kind, I wasn't sedated, but I was kind of loopy. I was kind of out of it. And they... Um, I only saw my baby for like 10 seconds before they took her away. So, you know, the whole time while I'm in recovery, I'm panicking because I'm, I'm just waiting for the phone call that she's gone. And my biggest fear was that I was never going to meet her. So um, I was overjoyed to hear that she was doing everything on her own. She was breathing on her own. She was, her heart was beating on its own. Um, I didn't know if she was eating on her own yet because they didn't want her to eat until they had done another MRI on her because just in case they needed to do brain surgery right away, 
um, she couldn't have anything in her system. So they had her on an IV. So we didn't know if she was going to eat on her own, but we, we just knew that she was doing what everybody said she wasn't going to do. So she went and she got, she's awake. Say hi, everybody. Say hi, everybody. Um, after, so they did her MRI and the neurosurgeon came back and he told us and he, you guys, you know, after everything we've been through, you guys won't believe this. The neurosurgeon told us that there was no tumor. And I was like, what do you mean there's no tumor? And he was like, there's no tumor. And it fell on the floor. And I was like, what? I mean, how? And so what they thought was a tumor, which the MRI revealed, we had two MRIs, we had, um, we had two MRIs, we had I think two or three nerves. We want me to put it. Give it to her. Um, we had two MRIs, and we had I think two or three neurosurgeons um, that evaluated her MRIs, and everybody said that it was a tumor. So, you know, it was kind of impossible for it to be a misdiagnosis. But he said that what they thought was a tumor was just an enlarged blood vessel splayed over the back of her head. And so at first, you know, they didn't know what the blood vessel was doing or how if it was affecting anything so they had to do what they call an angiogram which is where they put my baby to sleep and they stuck a catheter in her thigh and it went all the way up to her neck and they injected some dye and with that dye um, they were able to see the movement and the communication of her blood vessels and so after the angiogram they determined that the blood vessel that's in her head that looked like a tumor um, is doing nothing it's dormant um, it has still blood which means it has blood in it but the blood is it's still it's not moving it's not doing anything it's not communicating to any other blood vessels um, and they are they're assuming that um, the blood vessel was supposed to be one of the main vessels that's supposed to form at birth I mean at conception but it it for some reason it um, failed so since it failed, since it failed, all that blood and everything that was there just sat in the back of her head, and it made it appear originally that she had no brain and that she, you know all those diagnoses. And then at the end, it appeared to be a tumor, but um, it, it was nothing. I mean, not that it was nothing, but it was nothing as what we thought it was. Um, so her brain actually re rewired itself and made a new vessel and that new vessel is doing everything that it's supposed to do. Um, I mean, <laughs> to go from beginning to end, all I can say is she's a miracle. Um, and it breaks my heart to think that if I had listened to those doctors and I terminated her, I wouldn't have my angel here. Um, but. I just wanted all you guys to know um, what was going on because I didn't keep my pregnancy a secret, but I, I didn't really enjoy it at all. Um, and I didn't have a baby shower. I didn't tell anybody when I was delivering. Most of you didn't even know I had my baby until now because we were just so scared of, of what to expect. But um, she's here. Um, she's a fighter. She's just like her mama. And um, I just wanted to introduce her to you all at once so that the questions could be answered all at once. And um, so I didn't have to keep saying over and over what was going on, but you know, she's perfect. There's nothing wrong with her other than she has a, a, a large blood vessel on her head. Um, the doctor says that at this point, he, he doesn't want to do surgery on her. He just wants to leave the vessel alone because she's doing everything that she's supposed to do. Um, and but she does have to be seen every three weeks. We have to have an MRI on her every three weeks because we have to make sure that this vessel is not growing. Um, and she has to see a heart doctor also consistently. We have to make sure her heart is okay. But I mean, this is nothing short of a miracle. And um, if I didn't believe in miracles, if I didn't believe in God before, I sure as hell do now. Um, we finally have our baby. Um, she was in the NIC unit for seven days, so we barely came home last night. Um, but she's here. She's here. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I've had intuition, or I guess a woman's intuition, but throughout my pregnancy, I had a mama intuition. And I knew that 
my faith in God and God's plans were bigger and better than any doctor. Um, God is the ultimate physician and God told me what to do. And he told me, you know, he told me to fight and not to listen to those doctors. And, and I, and I didn't, I didn't. And she's here. Um, now, um, I do have some more news to share. Um, it's good and bad. Actually, my baby, Zylie, has some news to share. Um, so she has a little surprise for everybody. Hey, Mama. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to read this little sign. So I don't know if you can read this little sign, but this little sign says that Xylee is going to be a big sister. She's going to be a big sister to a baby brother. Now, for those of you who are kind of confused, um, my wife, D is pregnant, um, and we just found out that he, it's going to be a little boy. However, um, Unfortunately, I mean, nothing comes easy, and for some reason, God keeps testing us, but we found out that my wife is having some complications in her pregnancy, and her baby may not make it either. Um, I'm not going to say just yet what's going on, because we'd like to know more, and, you know, we'd like to, to, to really see what's going on 100% wise, but as of now, we're just going to pray, and we're going to ask you guys to pray. And, um, you know, I'm just so thankful to God that I have my angel baby, my little girl, and my wife is pregnant with our little boy. And like I said, I would appreciate your prayers and your thoughts. It's okay, Mama. I would appreciate your prayers and your thoughts on that. Um, I wasn't going to tell anybody that my wife was pregnant, but, you know, um, I'm asking for prayer warriors. So I, I would like... You know, like I said, those of you who are religious, to, to just watch over our family, to pray over our family. Here, baby. Take it. Not only for my wife and her pregnancy, but for, for my baby because, you know, her fight is far from over. Her, her fight is far from over. But I'm so happy to have all of that off of my chest. Um, but, you know, it's out there. All of you guys know. And so... Be prepared for an overload of pictures now that everybody knows that, you know, she's here and she's home. And for those of you who are close to us and, you know, live in the area, you want to see her, just text me and, um, you know, you guys can come over because um, we want to share her, you know, to the world. And I'm going to tell her story. I'm going to scream it on the top of the mountaintops because... Everybody deserves to know about my little angel baby. Everybody deserves to know about my little fighter. So um, thank you guys for watching. You know, for those of you who supported me and prayed for me my whole journey, or even at the end, you know, I did reach out to some people. You know, you guys know who you are. I did reach out to some people at the last minute, the night before my delivery, and I asked for prayers, and, you know, the prayers worked. The prayers worked. So now I just have to ask you guys to pray for my wife and our son to hope that, you know, she has a successful pregnancy and she gives birth to a beautiful little boy. I mean, if she doesn't, she doesn't. But, I, you know, of course, all we can ask is for you guys to pray. So um, thank you, everybody. And um, be prepared for pictures. Bye.